Hollywood became my mission field. And not to, not to, you know, try to convert people. It's really just to be a seed layer. Like, I know that that person's on a path that's leading down a very dark road. And I can shine light into that life by sharing the truth with them. That, to me, is the win. My main goal is to be like Johnny Appleseed and just like plant seeds, plant seeds, plant seeds. So we're talking with uh, Christopher Palaha uh, right now about uh, some of his work, about his faith background, and also about a new project he's working on called Aspire Circles. So Chris, I wanted to ask you first, for people who might not be too familiar with your personal story, even if they've seen you on on the big screen, can you tell us a little bit uh, about how you came to be a Christian about your faith journey? Sure, sure. Um, Well, I was born in Reno, Nevada, and my daddy uh, was a devout Catholic and my mom was a born again Christian. And so I grew up with a, just a household filled with the Holy Spirit and um, was taught to pray at an early age. And I remember one of the things that I used to pray for was wisdom as a little kid, because my dad told me the story about Solomon and David and, um, and how they just sought after wisdom. And, um, and I think a part of my story goes to, um, I would be remiss if I didn't include the fact that around my junior year in high school, uh, things were going really, really well. And I had this prayer because I used to pray all the time. I would pray at night and I'd pray, you know, for tests or whatever. And freshman year, I was, they called me the Jesus freak because I had little posters <laughs> on my wall praying for things, my little crucifix. And, um, <clears throat> and um, I remember having this prayer, which about 20 years later, I was able to identify as a prayer of pride. And it was basically me, you know, at 17 asking God if, if the good things that were happening in my life were because of him or if they were because of me. And so it was this moment where I guess, you know, humans that we toil, I think our struggle, I, I think our original sin is that we want to be God, our own gods, right? Mm-hmm. And I think we set up a world in which we can you know, manifest that destiny. And God was saying, you know, God saying, no, like, let me be the God and you be the person. But in that moment I prayed and I was like, you know, Lord, I don't know if this is you or me doing all these wonderful things. So I'm going to take a break for six months and I'll get back to you in six months. And within that six months, I don't know. I just kind of wandered away. I was always a Christian. I was always identified as a Christian, but I wasn't living like a Christian. And that six months turned into six years of me sort of wandering through this wilderness, spiritually speaking in that time. I, um, I, I did this thing called Semester at Sea and I went around the world and studied world religions and I looked at Shintoism and Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism and Muslim faith. And, and ironically, <clears throat> or supernaturally, as God would have it, my roommate was this guy named Ryan Johnson who was just this born again Christian. Um, and he was just talking like, so as I was exploring all these other faiths, trying to make sense of it all, trying to have an understanding of like, you know, not just, being a Christian because of tradition, but actually believing, you know, that, that Jesus is the savior. Um, and he was just talking to me. And so all of a sudden Christ just started working his way back into my life. It was actually amazing. I had a dream of, of, of Jesus riding through a destructed uh, cathedral on a Christmas tree. And I just remember my mom and my dad, my family were there. It was almost this apocalyptic dream. Um, and I remember there were just a series of events, um, an explosion in New York City. I was walking up Ninth Avenue and this building blew up. And the way that I situated myself with the girl that I was with, I was on her right and I moved to her left without any kind of prompting other than a, a spiritual prompting. It was like, I don't know why, but I feel better on the side of you. And then someone was trying to burn the restaurant down. The whole thing blew up. And I eclipsed all the shrapnel from hitting her, all the glass, took in 100, 100, 120 stitches later for myself. Um, and then all of a sudden, it was this almost like a slow, a slow decision to start moving back towards God. And I used to pray, like, go to God, go to God at night. Got confirmed in the Catholic faith uh, at St. Patrick's Cathedral. My uncle Andy, who was a priest, was able to uh, to walk me down that ceremony, like do the ceremony with me or whatever. And um, and I don't know, my prayer life just started to open up in a, in, a, in a new way. And then I remember when I did this pilot 
because I'd never really taken having a girlfriend very seriously. I was always very dedicated mm-hmm. towards becoming an actor and, and didn't want the, the, you know, be distracted basically. And um, I remember being in my trailer for this pilot I did 20 years ago, in fact, March, 2001. And we shot, and I wrote a little article in Variety for this. We shot in the six acre plaza of the World Trade Towers at the WTC. And the camera started on the top of the South Tower and moved its way down and found us in this work of art called the uh, Cloud Fortress. And, you know, we did our scene and it's really crazy. And I remember being on that set and I had this trailer and I remember getting down on my hands and my knees and I started praying. I was like, Lord, I'm ready to, to meet somebody. Like if you've got somebody that you want you know, me to meet, like I'm ready for her. And I remember how dirty the floor was. There was like dirt and sand on the trailer floor, but I was on my hands and my knees. And as a result of that pilot, I met this girl, Julianne, who ended up becoming my wife. And her faith was incredible. And her faith is powerful. Um, she grew up Christian. Her daddy was a Baptist preacher. Um, he actually spoke in Martin Luther King Jr.'s church back in the day. and used to do early uh, missionary work for Billy Graham, some of the crusade work early on for Billy Graham. And that, that relationship early on was God's way of, of sort of reintroducing me to his love. I don't know if that makes sense, but, yeah. but there was all of a sudden I was able to understand the fullness of love when he introduced me to her and, and our love sort of blossomed and became a marriage. And, and we had a really beautiful courtship. And, um, and so she's been instrumental and she was instrumental in my faith um, and really coming back to it. So it was, just, yeah. it was just, it was a, you know, I remember when I was a little tiny boy and I would, I would just pray to the Holy spirit all the time. Like I was just always in conversation with the Holy spirit. And I remember for whatever reason, walking away. And then there were these events in my life, these sort of cataclysmic events that just brought me back. Like it was undeniable. And, you know, the explosion, and I've told this story, faith wires actually run this story before uh, that, that the explosion, um, really did have supernatural elements where it felt yeah. like there was a, just a giant sort of angel or guardian angel, whatever you want to call it, that just kind of kept me out of, because instead of being blown up and knocked into the street and caught on fire and all these things, I mean, we were in a fireball, like I was surrounded by flames and then it goes back into the cellar, the glass comes out and instead of being knocked onto my feet into the street where cars were, the traffic was stopped a block later. Um, I was down, down city of the blast she was uptown of the blast we were both standing on our feet so it was just something just kind of picked us up and moved us mm-hmm. and i don't know and, and many times in my life um i've just i've met i've had encounters with god i mean i'm just I, it's it's undeniable to me so my faith at this point like it became foolish it was like i believe that my truck can get me from a to b and if i can believe that my truck can get me to a to b then why can't i believe in a god that created this universe that can get me through this life. And so, yeah, my faith the last 20 years, we've just been building it and, and reading the Bible and digging in and, and trying to have a lot of authority and wisdom. Yeah. Um, it's an ever growing relationship, you know? Yeah. You know, I think particularly if people, people who are front facing or in the media and, you know, we see them in movies like you, you know, whatever, uh, I think there's this, um, it's easy to assume that it just comes easy, that it just comes naturally, because we're just seeing like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we're not right. seeing everything that's under, uh, like all the, the stuff you just described that led you to have the faith that you have uh, yeah. today. Um, yeah. So I just wonder how, how do you stay grounded? I know you mentioned some of it is through discipline. You know, you just continue to read your Bible. You continue to practice prayer. Um, but but how do you stay grounded, particularly in, in this COVID era of, that we're in? I mean, my family is is everything. Yeah. My wife, we have three boys. They keep me grounded. They keep me real. Um, I will have a photo shoot or I'll have some fancy Hollywood shindig. And I'm, you know, and by historically... I will have gone from cleaning, you know, changing diapers, <laughs> you know, like wiping poopy bottoms of my little babies when they were, you know, when they were young to like then walking the red carpet. And it's always been put in perspective. It's always been put in perspective. It's never been like, oh, Hollywood. Um, and it's fascinating, man. When you're on a set and you start talking 
you know, very quickly the conversation can run dry. Like there's only so much acting you want to talk about. There's only so much politics you can or want to talk about. And then eventually if, you know, you're on set long enough, the conversation turns to life and death. And I think the question about our faith really comes into play when we start considering our mortality. Mm -hmm. Like if we're just, if we're just living for today, then why bother with faith? You know, because it's about getting everything that you need immediately right now, what you want, when you want it. But the minute you pump the brakes on that mindset and look at your life as this very fleeting sort of passage from birth to death and know that we're going to die. And we don't know. That's the crazy thing about life. And I think what, that's what COVID has been such a stark reminder of. And I think that's why it's been so terrifying for so many people, but also this amazing epiphany for so many other people is that COVID was this stark reminder that death can come at any moment and the whole yeah. world as we know it can shut down and shift on its access like without any kind of warning and so what does that beg it begs the question either there's this God in the universe that loves us that cares for us and the story is real and he brought Jesus to this earth and he showed us the way and through him we can have everlasting life or not <laughs> and it's just totally random and it's chaos yeah. So if you choose to believe in order and if you choose to believe in love and if you choose to believe in that truth, your life becomes a very different thing. And, mm -hmm. and that conversation becomes unavoidable. Like it's just, it starts to happen on set. My mission has always been to be, you know, I, I used to think about being an actor and, and there's a lot of people, it's funny, I'll do something and I'm sure I'll, I'll be in shows or movies that people are like, wait a minute, he is a Christian. How can he be a part of that? That doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense to me. But I think that first and foremost, you know, I'm a Christian. That's who I am. What I am is an actor. My job is an actor. I'm not a Christian actor. I'm an actor who is a Christian, right? So I'm going to do jobs where I'm showing what it looks like to not have Jesus. And it's really actually a, a fun character. Like a part of my character study is, is this guy a Christian? What kind of Christian is he? Is he, you know, is he a real conservative by the book rule guy? Is he a liberal guy? Like what kind of like, or is he not a Christian at all? And then if that's yeah. the case, what's his mindset? And that becomes a really fun aspect of character building. So for me, it's another tool. Um, but in that, I kind of sidetracked myself, but in that when you're sitting on set, like Hollywood became my mission field and not to, not to, you know, try to convert people, not to, although, you know, I've prayed some, I've prayed the walk with people, the Roman road with people, but like, it's really just to be a seed layer. Like, you know, like if I can have a conversation that makes somebody stop and think for a minute, and I know that that person's on a path that's leading down a very dark road and I can shine light into that life by sharing the truth with them. That to me is the win. Like, yeah. you know, I've actually sat down and I've been like, Hey, do you want to meet Jesus? And I've prayed, you know, I've, I've, I've done that with some actor friends of mine too, but like, that's not my main goal. My main goal is to be like Johnny Appleseed and just like plant seeds, plant seeds, plant seeds. And then yeah. also <clears throat> like you two or Johnny Cash. I mean, there've been a lot of entertainers who had something um, that was very attractive to the world. But then when you dig in and you understand what they believe or what they're rooted in, you realize that, that, you know, Jesus is at the center of it all. And you're like, Oh, that's cool. Like I didn't know that, but, and I'm, and I've always kind of, you know, I've gotten a little, a little more verbal, obviously talking with you guys, like I've gotten a lot more verbal about my faith than I was even five yeah. years ago. Um, but at the end of the day, I want to be, you know, people used to say like, you want to be a movie star? I'm like, I kind of rather be the sun. Like, I mean, the moon, like reflect the sun's light. <laughs> if I can do yeah. that, then I'm, you know, and I think, and I, I, I have no other choice, but to, but, but to honor my maker, like he gave me, all of the giftings that I have, he's the, like, I, I'm, I'm built the way that I'm built because of God. I have the gifts that I have because of God. I've been introduced to the people and put into places that I've been put into because I believe that God has orchestrated, you know, all of it. And so for me to like, try to keep something from God, which is frankly what I was doing. I think, I think yeah. if we really cut to the story, when I was 17, that's when acting started to really become its own, I guess, if you want to say idol or God in my life. And that was that choice of like, well, do I choose God? And maybe he doesn't want mm -hmm. me to be an actor or do I choose this? And maybe I get to have my own. 
you know, yeah. greatness. I can make my own story. Um, and I think, and I, I mean, I can recall back in 2016, it was not that long ago, when I just said, you know, Lord, I want you to have all of it. Take yeah. all of it. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of trying to control things. We try to, like, because I'll pray and I'll say, Lord, take my kids, keep them safe. I'll pray for them. I'll give, I'll give God my marriage. I've given God my finances. I'm like, Lord, like my money is your money. Do what you need with it. Help me when I make it, I'll make it. When I don't, like it's, it's in your hands. But yeah. for whatever reason, my career was always like greedy about it. I wanted to have this little precious thing. I don't know what I was after, but yeah, I've long let that go. <laughs> and so I'm just letting the wind blow me where it will. Yeah. You know, I heard a, a pastor one time say that, uh, you know, when people kind of mystify the will of God more than they need to. Uh, he said, I think, you know, you follow God, you follow Jesus, and then you do whatever you like. Uh, and then it, it kind of comes out of you. Uh, kind of like what you're describing is you can't help but talk uh, about your faith when you make it so central to your life. Um, right. And that kind of leads me to, to ask about Aspire Circles, because I've watched the trailer for, for your segment in there. I want you to tell us a little bit about how you got involved in it, what it is, but I, I can't help but see your faith coming out uh, in your role in it. Yeah. I mean, Aspire Circle is something that Chris Dowling, who is the director of Where Hope Grows and Run the Race, two films in which I starred, um, sort of wrote me and he was like, Hey man, there's a group of guys and they're putting this thing together. And would you be interested? And I got on a phone call and, and heard the pitch and it, it was a really attractive offer in the sense that they were inviting filmmakers to come in and talk about their craft, to create community for people who are filmmakers, who want closer access to the business, who may not live in Hollywood or New York, but who have talent and who have a desire to make movies. Um, but who also happen to be Christian. And there's a lot of people who feel there's this weird dichotomy <laughs> between Hollywood and Christianity and everyone, like there's this thing where forever it was like, it was like this, you know, Hollywood was seen as this dark fortress of immorality. <laughs> and, and yes, there is a lot of stuff that goes on in yeah. Hollywood that, and there's a lot of st stories that are told that come out of Hollywood that are not um, necessarily healthy or helpful or, and they're dark and they, you know, they lead people astray, but there's also a lot of beauty in Hollywood. And there's, there's a lot of things that have come out of that city and out of this town that have encouraged people and inspired people. And, you know, I don't think it's fair to separate. And so I, so we need storytellers who are just have a great moral foundation. We need storytellers who have a strength and a determination to not be torn asunder by all the temptations because there will be a lot of temptations especially when you come out here and you're successful and fame starts yeah. knocking on the door, people are crazy and you get like, I mean, it's crazy, you know, it's like, and so you need to have um, discipline and moral fortitude and you have to have direction and focus and you have to know whose you are in the way that, that the prize isn't the end, right? The prize of yeah. Hollywood or the prize of success in life, like journalism or business or, you know, the hundred million dollar contract that you're after, like, that's not the end goal. And I think that's what we see a lot of times in Hollywood is people without, and I think that's what we've witnessed because it's such a public business and such a public medium, everything's out there and it's supposed to be because it's up for our consumption as, as, a, as an audience. Um, <clears throat> you watch people who don't have anything rooting them and you've seen them destroyed and you've seen them die. Like we've watched people die over and over again because they're consumed with, you know, drugs, alcohol, fast living, all that stuff that kills you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and what I'm thinking is if, if you can fill Hollywood with a bunch of people who, um, who have moral fortitude, then the same stories are going to get told, but they're going to be told that's pushing us towards encouragement, that's speaking life mm -hmm. into our lives as an audience. I mean, stories yeah. have so much power. And I think that's what Aspire Circles is trying to do, is create a, a type of masterclass situation for people in the business who are making movies that inspire and movies that encourage people and movies that speak life into people um, yeah. and, and equipping students with those skills. 
Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I've, I've seen your Instagram and I remember you started last, I think it was like right at the beginning of, of the pandemic. Yeah, I started yeah, for COVID. Yeah, it was the <laughs> collage of taco. I just was like, yeah, I got to go live. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, it's crazy. Like social media, everybody's pumping out their own brand. It's like, yeah, they're all pumping themselves out. It's like, and I got to a point where I was like, I don't have anything important to say. Like, there's nothing about me that can change your life, make it better. I have nothing to offer except for the story of Jesus Christ. Like that's a cool thing that I can offer and I can share it. I can share my love and I can share my, my acceptance of Christ, my love of Christ. I can share that and I can tell you what that's done for me and that's it. And so that's what that Paula Hashitako became. It was like this place where people were really hurting and, you know, we can all, I can entertain, I can, I can entertain you for, you know, Along, I could sing and I could dance and I could tell you stories and I can distract you from your life for a time, but then you're still going to be left with that right. emptiness that only that I, you know, only God can fill. Yeah, and yeah, I, I I was watching a little bit before I got on this call with you a little bit of your latest episode. I think you you posted it yesterday. Uh, you're talking about uh, kingdom living. Um, and I thought, oh, such an important, uh, important thing to talk about. But I wanted to ask you, what does that mean for you personally? You've talked a little bit about like how you've grounded yourself and how you share the gospel when you get the opportunity. But kingdom living is probably, I guess, like a bit Christianese for people who might not be uh, believers. So what does that, what does that mean for you? Well, I think for me, it means, obviously, it's the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And when Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I think a lot of Christians think that our goal is that when we die, we'll have done enough good things to get into heaven or we'll have not done enough. We will not done so many bad things that we'll get into heaven. And my argument, and there's an amazing philosopher professor named Dallas Willard, who is down here at USC, um, who, who really sort of also believed this was that when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it means it's right here, right now. Mm. So that my objective as I'm walking through the world is if I can just sort of like slough off little tastes of heaven throughout the day, if I can show people what God's love looks like, if I can be patient when most people are going to be hasty, if I can be kind when most people are going to be angry and mean, if I can be you know, I used to pray all the time and I don't as much anymore, but show me people through God's eyes. I'd be like, Lord, show me them. Show me that person through your eyes. Like, let me see that person, how you see them, because I don't like them. Yeah. I don't like them at all. I don't want to punch them in the face. So show me how you see that person, because I need to love them like you love them. And I think if we started to really, I mean, I'm being honest, like right now, like yeah. all the division in the country right now, all of the hate in the world right now, and there's so much hate, it's tangible. There was so much tangible frustration in the streets, people yelling at each other to put a mask on, take your mask off, like all of this crazy division, political division, um, the socioeconomic division, race, which is a spiritual bondage that our country is trapped in. Like it mm-hmm. just keeps rearing its ugly head and all of this stuff can be broken with love. Yeah. And specifically Christ's love, like the love of the father who made this world, who created this universe. Like if you can tap into that, then right when you're about to say something ugly, if you can turn that into something beautiful, imagine the power of that. If right when you're on social media and you just want to like start to kill somebody with your words, you decide to type life into their life and encourage mm-hmm. them or just say, hey, I love you, whatever. And, and, and I understand that change has to get made. And I understand that there's, room for healthy debate. But again, that has to be done with kindness and that has to be done with peacefulness and joy and love. And so that's what kingdom is. That's this idea of if I can get on every Sunday and I don't have to necessarily talk about Jesus, but if I can talk about what it means, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Hindu or Muslim or atheist or whatever you define or call your, you know, whatever you ascribe to, um, you can still be a part of kingdom living in that there's this decision that you can make to, you know, be nice, be kind, be patient. Obviously the Holy spirit fills us with those things. Like, obviously there's a lot that comes with being a Christian because we have the gift of the Holy spirit that, 
yeah. then can move in us and give us a supernatural ability to be those things in situations that otherwise wouldn't, most people couldn't. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So that's kind so, of what I, so it's a roundabout way. It's like, it's, it's, it's an inclusive conversation and it always comes back to Christ. And it's like, mm. you know, talking about making it here and now little tastes yeah. of heaven. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know you've, you've given, you've been generous with your time. I want to ask you one more question, which is just uh, for somebody who is eager to kind of get into the entertainment industry, a believer who wants to, you know, do the right thing, but not be, you not be bogged down with all the stuff you just talked about, the divisiveness and the, you know, all that stuff. I know some of it just comes with the territory, um, but what, what word of advice would you give, would you give somebody? Oh man. Um, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I don't mean to plug Aspire Circles, but if you, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you join the class, there's actually this amazing dialogue that happens. Yeah. Um, and weekly, you'll get a video that will kind of uh, encourage and, and enlighten you as to how to get a foothold in the business, no matter where you are, um, and how to just start creating content. And again, the stories that we tell... Um, they're important. And my Aspire class, for example, my Aspire circle, uh, I talk about how like each actor that we know, like Brad Pitt, DiCaprio, like they have these stories that they keep telling. These sort of, sorry, my dog is snoring. Um, <laughs> these sort of characters that they portray over and over again. And so it comes out of you. Like if you're somebody yeah. who wants to tell a story and, and you live in you know Des Moines, Idaho, and you're like, well, I'll never make it to Hollywood. I'll never do this. You can actually grab a camera and you can grab people in your life and you could. And so what we do at Aspire Circle is tell you how that story should be told, what act structures are, what all the technical aspects are so that the things that feel unknown and the, the things that feel kind of scary and might prohibit you from actually doing something are made very evident and made very clear and shown that, yeah, it's not that big a deal. It's not that scary. Um, yeah. It's a place for filmmakers to elevate their craft um, I love the fact that it's a community. So people who are, if you are from Des Moines, you can actually meet people all over the country and all over the world, other people who are interested in filmmaking. And then yeah. three yeah. times out of the class, we get on Zoom. And so you'll actually meet your instructors, which is kind of a cool aspect, yeah. um, which is unique in, in those master class type situations. Because usually it's just videos. And this one, you get the videos and you actually meet, you get to meet us, which is kind of cool. Yeah. That's awesome. And it's so cool to see things like Aspire Circles who are that, that are really kind of making this stuff accessible really for the first time because it's, uh, you know, it's giving people, like you said, just a direct connection to this is what you need to do uh, if you want to, you know, advance yourself. And I think it's 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 so cool that, that you've been a part of it and that, um, that, like I said, it gives people who have the talent but don't feel like they've got the connections. Maybe it'll right. give them a, a little bit of, of hope, but it'll also give them knowledge and, and the tools they need to, to be able to make it in their uh, in their field. So um, I remember when Francis Ford Coppola said, you know, the next great filmmaker is going to come out of Ohio, some kid with a camcorder. And you know, my, like I remember being a kid in Reno, Nevada and, and my buddy Graham and I used to grab my dad's VHS camera and we'd make these movies. And there was a certain point at which, you know, we had to shoot to edit. So we would shoot and then cut. And then the next shot was because we, we'd never had a tool to edit with. Um, but now with Aspire Circles, like if you go through the whole process, you're going to learn if you have a camera or your phone, like you'll be like, oh, I actually know how I can, I can make a movie. Like this is kind of yeah. cool. So it's the ultimate democratization of the, of the industry, which um, is where we're heading anyway. So, yeah, for sure. Well, thank you again, uh, Chris. I appreciate you taking a few minutes to talk with us at Faithwire. Oh, I'm uh, digging the Wonder Woman on, on the back there. You got yeah, Wonder yeah. Woman. Yeah. <laughs> she, so uh, I, DC, I, I was always a Marvel guy, but I, uh, Wonder Woman is, uh, is my favorite uh, on the DC side. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I, I, I was a big fan of both of the movies and am looking forward to the next one already. So That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah, I appreciate you taking it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You too.